Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. A few people are coming into the space as we transition from one Zoom to the next. I want to maximize every second that we have, so I'm going to begin. Um, so again, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Gloria Narona, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at William James College. Welcome everybody to our MLK Day 2022 celebration. Each year in the United States, um, the third Monday of January, we observe Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We reflect on the work that still needs to be done for racial equality. This January 17th, I invite you all to make the holiday more than just a day off. Take some time to reflect and take action in small ways because these small steps have great ripple effects. According to the King Center, the theme for this year is, it starts with me. As I reflect on this theme, I am reminded of a poem by Dana Foles titled, Self-Observation Without Judgment. I'm gonna share it with you all by sharing my screen. And I invite, um, I invite you all to reflect as I read the poem. Self-Observation Without Judgment by Dana Foltz. Release the harsh and pointed inner voice. It's just a throwback to the past and holds no truth about this moment. Let go of self-judgment, the old learned ways of beating yourself up for each imagined inadequacy. Allow the dialogue within the mind to grow friendlier and quiet. Shift out of inner criticism and life suddenly looks very different. I can say this only because I make the choice a hundred times a day to release the voice that refuses to acknowledge the real me. What's needed here isn't more prodding toward perfection but intimacy, seeing clearly and embracing what I see. Love, not judgment, sows the seeds of tranquility and change. Dana's poem is a reminder that to engage in the work of justice, we have to do the self work, our individual work to take care of ourselves. This work requires strength and asks us to be brave despite the mistakes that we make on this journey. The stronger we are, the more impactful our work will be. It starts with me. Our keynote speaker today is a friend whose personal journey embodies our MLK theme. It starts with me. Mike Vini was determined to overcome a lifetime of serious mental health challenges, to become a professional drummer and a certified corporate wellness specialist. He's the author of the best selling book, Transforming Stigma How to Become a Mental Wellness Superhero. His expertise and life experience have been featured on ABC, NBC, and CBS News. As a 2017 PM360 Elite Award winner, Mike Vini was recognized as one of the 100 most influential people in the healthcare industry. As co-host of Better Mental podcast, Mike shares insightful experience as a business owner living with, with mental health challenges. <clears throat> His captivating presentations are popular with companies, including Microsoft, CVS Health, T-Mobile, Heineken, Salesforce, and the Wounded Warrior Project. He is always busy writing, speaking, and teaching continuing education courses. And I am so humbled and grateful that he accepted this invitation to speak. In his spare time, he enjoys weight training, meditating for 20 minutes twice a day, and eating a good bone and ribeye steak cooked medium rare. He lives in New York City and is addicted 
to buying luggage, along with watching YouTube videos on how to pack a suitcase. His packing checklist for business trips is one of the most prized possessions. He is our returning guest to William James community. Please unmute yourself and join me in welcoming back Mike Feeney as our keynote speaker for MLK Day 2022. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all. Um, I actually have to, after this meeting, I have to go pack my suitcase. So it's interesting that you brought that up. Um, let's see here. I'm just trying to move things so I can get to my presentation here. Okay, can you see my screen? Looks good. There we go. Okay. Thank you all for hanging out with me today. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be back. And for those of you that have heard me before, I hope I can give you something of value. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm a professional speaker. I have the honor of traveling around this very unique country and speaking at events in so many places. And oftentimes, as a person of color, I get hired to speak in the deep South where I'm the only person that looks like me for miles, if you know what I mean. And I'll never forget, there was this one time I was speaking in Georgia, deep South in Georgia, where I did not see another person of color. And the person who hired me actually picked me up from the airport, very nice. And, and we actually decided to go out to a bar to just chat and, and eat some food. And, and I remember feeling a little uncomfortable in the bar because I think I was getting a look of like, who are you? Why are you here? I don't know. That's the story I was telling myself. And, you know, he, he got to a point in the conversation where he, he became very hesitant. And, and he said, Mike, I, I, I want to ask you something, but I don't want to come off as a racist. I said, okay, well, we'll just ask what's on your mind. And he just simply asked me what my experience was like with racism. That was it. But it reminded me of that moment that oftentimes we walk on eggshells in this world and you got to watch what you say to people. You really do. You can get yourself in trouble these days. You got to watch what you say to people. My name is Mike Vini. I'm a certified corporate wellness specialist. And my company is accredited by ISET, the International Accreditors for Continuing Education and Training. And my mission is to support people in discovering the gift of emotional wellness. That's what I do. And in today's presentation, it's informed by psychological research and my own life experience. And I'm gonna give you some strategies to help with your mental wellness and actually diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> Something you should know, I'm not a mental health professional. No, I am not. So if you get triggered by something I say, please talk to a mental health professional or call 911. I'm gonna be talking about some very deep stuff, especially as I talk about my childhood. So just a warning for all of you. That being said, I have a confession to make. Um, as a professional speaker, this presentation that you are going to get, it, it's the first of its kind. I actually um, put it together at 7 o'clock a.m. this morning. Brand new presentation. And the other thing that you should know is I've been speaking for 11 years as a speaker. And up until recently, I have never used PowerPoint in my life. So this idea of like clicking something and you seeing a slide is so brand new. So if I seem a little weird, that's why. But with that being said... My team that works for me kind of pressured me into using PowerPoint. They said, you need to start using PowerPoint for accessibility, you know, and to help with the presentation. So I said, okay, reluctantly, but I said on one condition, if I get to make the slides. So you are gonna see me having been using PowerPoint for like just two weeks now <laughs> and created some slides. I don't know what you're about to get. So please forgive me in advance for um, any mishaps or seeing something that you're just not used to. That being said, I would like to dedicate this presentation to someone special, someone very, very special in my life, my hamster. That's not my real hamster. That's a pretty cool hamster though, right? With the dumbbells, strong hamster. My hamster um, was a dwarf hamster and he lived with me about 10 years ago. It's two and a half inches long. He was one of my favorite pets. He had a really nice vibe about him. But one day I went to go pet him and uh, tried to bite me. Whoa, get away from that. Um, Several months into him living with me, his eye was winking like this one day where um, I guess it was stuck. His right eye was shut. So I didn't know what to do. So I realized I had to make my first ever trip to a veterinarian. 
Very expensive, by the way, veterinarian. They charged me $100 to weigh him in a foam cereal bowl. But whatever, I needed my little hamster to get help. So the veterinarian puts on the rubber gloves and tries to restrain my little two-inch hamster. And uh, my hamster bites him. So he put the hamster down, leaves the room, and has to get a nurse. So now we have two grown adults in the room trying to restrain my little two-inch hamster. So they're both holding the hamster. And my little hamster bites her. She leaves the room and she's actually in the hallway like saying like, I don't want to go back in the room with that hamster. Finally, we get three grown adults to come into the room and restrain my hamster. And we got him the help that he needed. But at that point, when they were restraining my hamster, I made it a point to take out my phone and take a picture of it right there. That's my hamster getting restrained. And I took that picture because I don't ever want to see that again. Because seeing my hamster get restrained reminds me of being in the mental hospital. And I've been there way too many times. I've been battling with mental health my whole life. And the best way I can describe it for you is by describing what I love deeply in this world, food. If you want to be my friend, you got to like food. I don't care if that's shallow. I'm a foodie. And if you can picture an oven, not like a regular oven, but an industrial strength Viking restaurant oven. On the top right burner simmering in a frying pan is my obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm trying to give a presentation to you right now. I am obsessing about 10 different things and it's making it hard to focus. On the lower right burners, my anxiety. I don't know how I'm coming off to you right now, but I feel it in my chest. On the top left burners, my anger and depression. But on the bottom left burners, a stock pot. And I can take the ingredients from each frying pan, put it into the stock pot, close the lid and turn up the heat. That's a problem waiting to happen in my kitchen. And if you're following me, the kitchen I'm talking about is not in my home, it's in my head. I've been in this kitchen my whole life and it's made it difficult to make friends. It's made it difficult with work. It's made it difficult with dating. And it just makes life hard, sometimes every single day. And when we talk about mental health, we talk about three things, thoughts, feelings, and behavior. If any one of those has a challenge, you have a mental health challenge. And everything with me started with behavior, with my mental health. I remember like I was yesterday, that's me. I was a child who grew up in Long Island. I had a wonderful home that I grew up in. And my mom was my biggest fan. She passed away several years ago, but she, she really loved me. And her and my dad stayed married till uh, she passed away. And this is my dad. We took that picture about a month ago right there. And um, he wanted to be at this presentation today. I don't think he's clicking in. I have been looking for his name. If you see another Michael Beanie come in, that's my dad. And, um, you know, I have a younger brother, Jason. But we started to notice at a certain point that I started to have temper tantrums and I would get upset constantly. And I found myself constantly in trouble. I was constantly getting in trouble. So my parents decided to put me in this place called Catholic school where they figured the nuns would straighten me out. So second grade goes good, third grade goes okay. But in fourth grade, I think uh, you can relate to this experience. We've all had this experience in school where you have that one teacher that nobody wants to get as a teacher. The teacher has a reputation for, I don't know, being mean, evil and alien or something like that. Well, my school, her name was Sister Pat. And she was known as the evil nun. And I knew from day one, she and I were not gonna finish the school year together. Nope, wasn't gonna work. So I was sitting there in class like this, kind of like I'm right now, just sitting here. She yelled at me and told, told me to wipe the smile off my face. And uh, I said the thing you should not say to your teacher in fourth grade. I said, no. So everybody starts going, ooh. So Sister Pat then approached me and started yelling at me. I got really angry and I said some things back to her that I'm not going to repeat right now. She then tried to grab me by my arm and pull me out of my desk. I tried to punch my teacher as hard as I could. She then took holy water and threw it on me and called me the devil. I took the holy water and threw it back at her and said, put this on your wrinkles. I was expelled from school that day. My parents had a very serious talk with me about respect, a very serious talk. And I told them that nobody has a right to talk down to me. But needless to say, I'm expelled from school beginning of fourth grade. They then decided to put me in a public school where my uncle was the principal. They thought it'd be good for me, good for his career. Long story short, after three weeks and several fights and a desk mysteriously flying out of my hands in the direction of my teacher, I was expelled from that school. But I gotta tell you, rest of fourth grade, best school year ever. I got to stay home every day. That's back in a time when we wanted to stay home. We're done with that now. But back then it was great, I got to stay home every day. The summer between fourth and fifth grade, my parents took me to see Batman the movie. And I like to qualify this because I take my superheroes very seriously. This was not George Clooney or Ben Affleck. It was Michael Keaton starring as Batman. 
when Jack Nicholson was the Joker. And for those of you that are following, Michael Keaton is coming back in the Flash movie as Batman. But got to see the movie, and I don't know if it was the movie or something else, but I came home from the movie and got angry at a level that I never had before. I went into what we call a rage. I was angry for hours, punching things and destroying things in my parents' home. Nothing could stop me. The next thing I know, I'm put in a mental hospital. And I just want to be honest, it's a scary place, especially when you're a kid. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to think of myself. They took away all my property, my shoelaces, and didn't help that right across the street from the mental hospital was the county jail. So I could look out my window and see the jail and, you know, realize that the people in the jail had the same rights as me. What was I supposed to think about myself? But I quickly learned the secret to getting out of the mental hospital. There's a secret. I probably shouldn't tell you this, a little hack to get yourself out. The hack is you have to convince them you have coping skills. And if you do that persuasively, they let you out. And that's what I did. Never going to go back there again. In fifth grade, I was put in special education. Probably had the one teacher in school that I never messed with. Saw this woman a few years ago. She's about five feet tall. She still scares me. I keep my distance. I don't know why. But I found a way to annoy her. I would just tap on my desk and play drum beats. Loved the feeling of playing drums. Just made me feel good. And eventually, they let me go into the drum class. And I got to tell you, I was um, preparing for this presentation this morning. I picked up my drumsticks. It just grounded me. It felt so good just to hold, love playing drums. And most of the time, though, when I was in fifth grade, I was not in the drum class. I was going to school. I was with friends and family. And I was starting to experience what I would later learn is called depression. I would feel this intense sadness that was physical pain in my body. Oftentimes when we struggle with mental health, we simply want a solution. So I decided one day to get a solution for myself. September 29th, 1989, I came home from school and I went into the cabinet and found my mental health medication, opened an entire bottle of pills and swallowed a bottle of pills and ended up passing out and almost dying by suicide at age 10. My mom found me and rushed me to the hospital and saved my life. Had she not done that, I wouldn't be here talking to you. And I'll be honest with you, I was pissed off at her because she was getting in the way of me taking care of the pain. I just wanted the pain to go away. Things got worse after that in seventh grade. Started to go down rabbit holes, spiraling. I'm a lot bigger and I'm a lot stronger and I'm acting out more at home. I'm going into rages, but I want to be honest with you, when you're in seventh grade and you go into a rage at home, it's not a rage anymore. It's called violence. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but I want to tell you the truth about what happened. I was angry and violent and out of control. And I started doing this thing called self-harm. Self-harm is an interesting one because we think of one thing, but self-harm can be anything that you do to harm yourself. It could be hanging out with the wrong group of people. It could be destructive driving. There are three reasons why people self-harm. We do it, one, to take away the pain. Two, it can become an addiction. Or three, some people think it's cool. Either way, if you are self-harming, I encourage you to talk to a mental health professional about it. Promise you it's one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself. But back to seventh grade, I'm imploding, I'm exploding. Next thing I know, back in the mental hospital. And this time they were not buying my coping skills story. I was there for six months. My parents had to make up a story about me. I mean, you know, oftentimes when a child is struggling, it's very hard on a parent, you know, especially in the black community where we just don't talk about mental health. So my parents made up a story about what was going on with me. Eventually though, I got weekend passes. Got weekend passes to go home. And um, my parents, they wanted to do family activities, like go out to eat, stuff like that. But I didn't want to do any of that. So I would lock myself in my bedroom and play drums to LL Cool J and Red Hot Chili Peppers. That was seventh grade. Between seventh grade and 10th grade, I am proud to say, whoa, there's my picture, sorry. I was on a first name basis with the local police and the local emergency room. And I knew their favorite sports teams and their kids' names. And by the time that I had finished 10th grade, I'd been expelled from three schools, hospitalized at a mental hospital three times, several suicide attempts, lots of self-harm, and violent at home. We had a problem here. I was on so many different medications. No school wanted me. And that summer, uh, my mom approached me and asked me a question. Now, I want to say something about moms because I know we got a lot of moms on this call right here. Moms... I love moms. They're the hardest working people on the planet. In my company, we got so many moms on the team. They get stuff done like nobody's business. Like seriously, if you want something done, give it to a mom. 
They know how to get stuff done. But let's be honest, moms are the sneakiest group of people on the planet at the same time. Even when you're an adult, they do this thing called giving you the mommy look where they look at you and they're telling you one thing, but you know they're plotting something else. Well, my mom approached me with the mommy look that summer and she asked me a question no one had ever asked me. She asked me, what would make you happy? This kind of threw me because no one ever asked me that. They told me what I needed to do to behave and that I needed to get coping skills, but no one ever asked me what would make me happy. So I thought about it and thought about it and realized the only thing that would make me happy is playing the drums. So my mom went out of her way to find a performing arts high school for me where I could go play drums. And despite my record, they accepted me. By the way, look at that hair, by the way, and those sideburns. I had hair back in the day right there in that picture. I was cool back in the day. I was. I miss that hair. I think about it all the time. But there I was amongst my fellow artists. And for some odd bull reason, my grades went up. With the help of my psychiatrist, my medication went down to nothing. People wanted to be my friend. There I was playing music every day. One day, this teacher yelled at me and spoke down to me. And I knew my career here was going to be done. I felt my fists clench. The cool thing about a performing arts high school is that you can actually just go into a room and play your instrument, practice your instrument. They have rooms with drums in them. So I stormed out of class, went into a room to go play drums by myself. Now, pause this whole presentation. If I were doing this live, I actually bring drums with me. But where I am right now, um, I will annoy a lot of people if I start playing drums. So you're just going to have to imagine me playing drums. I just sat there doing my thing. And the teacher comes in the room and says, Mike, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing my thing. He said, 15 minutes. I calmed down. First time in my life. Calm down. No suspension, no expulsion, no police, no mental hospital. Weird. Several months later, I decided I want to be a girlfriend. And the one girl that I liked was just not having it. And I didn't know what to do with my feelings. And so I stormed out of class and went into a room to go play drums by myself. I just sat there doing my thing. The teacher comes in the room and says, Mike, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing my thing. But then he asked me a question that changed my life forever. He asked me, can I hire you to play drums in my band? What? At that moment, the light bulb went off in my head. When I acted out the other way, I got suspended, expelled, or went to the police. But when I got on the drums, people wanted to pay me money. So I approached my parents as a high school senior with a conversation no parents of a high school senior want to have when their other child is talking about law school. And I said, mom and dad, I want to be a drummer. And at age 18, it was interesting. My first semester of college, um, I went you know, to hang out with my friends and stuff freshman year. But at the end of the semester, people usually go out and celebrate after exams. I couldn't go out and hang out with my friends at age 18 after first semester of college, finished my exams, and I had to get on a plane because I was being paid thousands of dollars a drum in, to play drums around the country as a drummer. The career worked. Fast forward to today, I'm still a drummer, but I actually do corporate drumming in the workplace. And this is me drumming with the Wounded Warrior Project's physical health and wellness team. I get to bring the medication that helped me into the workplace. I get to bring drums into the workplace. People get sweaty, happy, and pay me and hug me. Like that's my job, like a grown up child. I love it, absolutely love it. And I noticed something when I started doing this corporate drumming thing that for some reason people get really happy. And at this presentation that I did with the Wounded Warrior Project, I actually had to do a mental health presentation first and then the drumming presentation. And at that moment, I really realized that, you know, mental health issues and people issues go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And that was the start to realizing the connection between diversity, equity, and inclusion and mental health. In my book, Transforming Stigma, I give that one of the reasons for uh, stigma is called the law of inclusion and exclusion. And let's just pretend for a second that you and I are on the playground in uh, kindergarten and uh, you and your friend have Nike sneakers, but I have Reebok sneakers. Chances are you're gonna notice that and call me weird. That's what kindergartners do, they call each other weird. We think it's funny, even though we all did it, but think about what they're doing. They're figuring out who is in the group and who is not in the group. And throughout life, nobody wants to feel like the weird one. We bring that with us. And when it comes to issues of feeling excluded, um, feeling like people hate you because of how you look, we feel left out. And that's a problem that affects mental health. So there's a huge connection between diversity, equity, and inclusion and mental health. And I want to explain three points to keep in mind 
as you navigate this new year. One, the subject of diversity, equity, and inclusion triggers emotions, triggers emotions. You know, when I say the word diversity, how are you feeling when I say that? Some people might be like, oh yeah, this is great. We're talking about it. Someone else might be frustrated. Why are we hearing this again? And I'll be honest with you. I do a lot of work in this space. People say the word diversity to me and I, I roll my eyes sometimes. Why are we going to talk about this again? That's okay. It doesn't matter what you feel. It's just important to understand that this subject in and of itself triggers emotions. So it's really important that when you enter into sensitive conversations, you are aware of your own emotions. That can teach you a lot. It's not about good emotions or bad emotions. It's just understanding your emotions. Really important to do. Also, minority groups are uniquely traumatized. I chose this phrase very carefully because simply to say that minority groups are traumatized, well, that's not really true because all of us are traumatized, right? It doesn't matter who you are. In fact, as humans, that's what we do. We traumatize each other and get traumatized. That's how we function in the world. And so it's important to know that minority groups have a unique type of trauma from things like racism that has taken place over many generations. So oftentimes what someone like myself might be feeling in a certain situation might be different if you're not a minority and you just might not get it and that's okay. So you don't have to fully get it. It's just important to understand that it's a unique type of trauma just to simply exist as a person of color. Also, people with disabilities are often overlooked. And I said disabilities, but I'm really referring to internal disabilities, especially mental health. Physical disabilities seem to be dealt with much better than them. Mental health, you know, people sometimes just don't want to deal with that person who struggles with their mental health. And what they miss out on is someone with, with some very unique gifts. So one of the things that we've all been trying to do is create some solutions to help the world. That's one of the reasons we're here, right? We want solutions to this stuff. So let's talk about some of the solutions that we've had, especially in terms of conversation. That's what I wanna talk about, how we've done conversations. What kind of solutions have we had? Well, the main kind of solution that I have noticed that we've had is we like to fight with each other. Look at that hamster right there. Totally took a swipe at that other hamster. The things you find on the internet. We love to fight with each other. We love to point fingers about someone else being wrong, you know, and definitely we love to go head to head with people that disagree with us. But I want to challenge you to think differently about this. As we go into this second year of a pandemic or third year, sorry, of a pandemic. Remember when it was only two weeks, by the way, it was supposed to be two weeks. We're in the third year now of this pandemic. And as we are dealing with lots of issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion and mental health, I want you to remember something as you start this year. And this, what I'm about to share with you is gonna help you get through this year. It's gonna help you be emotionally well and help others. And that's, it starts with me. It simply starts with me. Here's what that means. When you have an opportunity to have one of these sensitive conversations where you maybe need to watch what you say, the worst thing that you can do is think about what's politically correct. Think about some type of a theory or something you learned in school. The best thing you can do is be a human in that moment with someone else. In fact, I challenge you to take an opportunity to look into someone's eyes and see their humanity when you have these conversations. Very important to do. Now, I'm gonna share with you three questions that you can ask in these sensitive conversations that are going to make everyone uncomfortable and awkward because that's what you want and that's how we're going to heal and get better as a world the first question what do you see happening that i don't see you know i get to speak in the south as i told you and uh whew, i get i get to take part in some very interesting conversations and i tell audiences you can just ask me anything well the stuff that comes out of people's mouths it's pretty entertaining but you know, one of the things that came up was um, Black Lives Matter. Some some person who was not a person of color, a white person, had asked me about Black Lives Matter. And he was just basically telling me how he thought it was a, a violent movement and all this stuff. And I felt my blood kind of like boiling, like, man, you don't know what you're talking about. But I, I, I said, no, Mike, 
<laughs> go by what you teach others here. <laughs> so I asked him, what do you see happening here that I don't see? And I made it a point to pause and just listen, just listen. And what was really interesting is he kept talking and again, I didn't agree with anything, but I tried to just listen. And as I gave him that space, he turned around and asked me the same question. What do you see happening that I don't see? And I got to share my perspective. And we had a nice bonding moment and we've been friends ever since. It's really important to learn to ask questions like this, give people the space to answer. Another question. How do you think you're perceived by me? You have a story in your head about how you think I perceive you, and I have one in my head about how I think you perceive me. It's important that we talk about that stuff. And most of the time, it's just a story. But having those conversations is so important. And one of my favorite ones is, what do you feel that I need to be doing that I'm not doing? Oftentimes, when people of color are struggling with racial issues. I get calls from my white colleagues and friends and say, okay, well, what do I need to do? And I go, I really don't know. I chill out. That's usually what I tell them. Just chill out, calm down, like relax. Oh, you're not a bad person. But even if it's, you know, not a situation that's about race, maybe it's a, a family member that you're disagreeing with. Asking them that question, what do you feel that I need to be doing, but I'm not doing is so important. And it's important to also listen to the answer. So these three questions, I just wanna go over them again. What do you see happening that I don't see? How do you think you're perceived by me? What do you feel that I need to be doing, but I'm not doing, can really help you bond with people as we have these very sensitive discussions. And what that does, it gives people space to talk about things that are on their mind, which improves everyone's mental wellness, makes everyone feel more included and take steps to improving equity for all of us. And then we go back to hamsters. There is no purpose to this slide, ladies and gentlemen. I just saw cute hamsters and I decided to put the picture. I'm new to PowerPoint. I don't know how you're supposed to do things, but I wanna tell you, I graduated from hamsters and I got me a dog. That's Pippin right there, that's my dog. And like me, he's got emotional problems. In fact, we had to have a little discussion before this presentation because he was acting out. But I wanted to just tell you about a few things that are happening that you should know about. My company, as I said, is accredited for continuing education. And uh, we provide courses for CEUs on my website. Uh, one of them is called Connectivity and Conversations. And that's actually also a book that's on Amazon. You're the first people I get to show this to. It came in the mail. I got to smell it for the first time today. It smells like a book. And so that's all about workplace mental health. And I'm the co-host of the Better Mental podcast. But I wanted to say thank you and what's your next step? What is your next step? I gave you a bunch of things to think about to navigate this year. Um, I would like you to go on LinkedIn and leave me a message and let me know what you are gonna take away from this presentation and start implementing. Please let me know, please leave a message on LinkedIn. And that being said, I wanna say thank you for being here today. I'm gonna to take some time for questions in a moment and find me on social media um, on every single site. But in closing, I want to share a story with you that I think sums up everything in this presentation. And if you take nothing else, I want you to take what happened in this story to think about this connection between mental health, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, years ago, I was in the airport in Newark, New Jersey. And I'm going to be very honest with you. This was one of those days where I just really didn't care about my appearance. I'm not going to lie. Like, I didn't shower, I didn't shave, and my butt crack was hanging out. Like I was having a rough day that day, right? And I was looking for the number one thing we all look for in the airport, an outlet to charge my phone. And I finally see an outlet and there's this woman sitting there and I'm thinking, oh gosh, this is not a moment for me to talk to somebody. Let me just, you know, have the outlet. So I actually came up to her, I think I got a little too close. And, and I said, uh, excuse me, ma'am, can I share your electricity? You gotta watch what you say to people, by the way. She just gave me this look and just like rolled her eyes and squirmed away from me, squirmed away. So I sat down and, you know, charging my phone and you all know me now, I'm kind of friendly. I try to be friendly. So I said, hi. And she kind of said hi reluctantly. And I started asking her about what she does. Turned out she worked for a law firm in New York city. So I thought to myself, whoa, Law firms, they definitely need mental health speakers. Maybe they can hire me. So I started telling her all about my mental health and 
all the things I've shared with you. And she's just rolling her eyes and still doing that squirm that women do to just like move away, right? Move away. And so finally, um, before my flight, I, I asked her for her contact information. She quickly gave me her business card, walked away. Weird experience. So, you know, you're supposed to follow up with people and um, on her business card, there was her cell phone number. And I, I don't know, me being me thinking cell phone number, that's fair game for a text message right there, right? So I actually texted her. I said, hey, this is Mike from the airport. Do you want to grab coffee sometime? She said, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm real busy and I'll get back to you in a few weeks. So I put it in my calendar, talk to her in a few weeks, get coffee. A few weeks comes around, reached out to her again. She reluctantly said yes to grabbing coffee with me. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. When we went to coffee, I got to meet up with her. She said, I only have just, you know, 30 minutes. She looked completely different than she did at the airport. Let me describe her. She was about, I don't know, five, five four, and she was a brunette and, and her hair was in a bun at the airport. But when I met her for coffee, her hair was down to the floor and she's wearing this really long skirt. And, and so I, I said to her, I said, ma'am, you got some really long hair. And she just kind of looked up at my head and didn't say anything. And, and, and basically she said, well, that's part of my faith. I said, what's your faith? She said, I'm a conservative apostolic Pentecostal Christian. I said, well, uh, what the heck is that? And she explained to me, it's one of the most conservative forms of Christianity. And I told her very honestly, I said, look, you know, I, I grew up in, 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 in the church, but, you know, I, I don't do church. You're not going to give me no pamphlets, right? She said, no, I'm not going to give you any pamphlets. And I realized at that moment, like you had the two opposite sides of the country sitting here for coffee. We sat down and got coffee and we started talking about things. Turns out she was from St. Louis, right where the whole racial incident many years ago with Michael Brown getting shot happened. And she was telling me about how racism is. And I could tell right away who she voted for. She could tell who I voted for for president. It was an awkward conversation, you know? And um, I don't know, she's just really weird, you know, totally out of my element. And, um, you know, I kept in touch with her through the years. I kept in touch with her. And I actually asked her for um, her permission. I said, can I talk, you know, to, to William James College about this, this story? And she said, yes. I said, can I show your picture? She said, yes. She gave me permission. So that's her picture right there. And the reason I bring up is because in that coffee shop, we had the two opposite sides of the country that are fighting with each other together in that coffee shop. And now she's my wife. So I wanted to let you know that... <laughs> When it comes to this opportunity that we have to have these sensitive conversations, it's an opportunity to connect with another human being. Thank you, honey, for letting me use the picture. And <laughs> that being said, I just want to thank you all for listening to me present and being here. And we're going to take some time for questions or conversation. Thank you so much, Mike. That was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> yes, please feel free to unmute again and share your appreciation for my words today. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we can, uh, Mike is available for some questions, as he said, we can put them in the chat or feel free to unmute um, and, and ask them yourself. So questions for Mike. I know y'all aren't quite fun, so come on. <laughs> I just want to say thank you and what a beautiful, beautiful story of meeting your wife and the process that unfolded. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, saying that. You know, I always tell people, you know, uh, uh, in our home, she keeps her King James Bible because she's a fundamentalist. It's got to be the King James version. I got my meditation chair, my essential oils, like leave me alone in my little towel book. And, you know, people think it's like, must be like a holy war up in here, but no, we have some great conversations, you know, and, and it's an opportunity for me to learn about her, her to learn about me. And, and, you know, I, I don't think we agree on anything, but food, like that's our only thing. It's like, what restaurant we're going to, you know? So <laughs> that's why I want to let you know the, the, the point of all that was that um, in this world where it feels like we're having this divisiveness, it's actually an opportunity for connection if you choose to look at it that way. So thank you for saying that. Mike, I just wanted to say that um, 
your presentation was really powerful. So I'm looking at it from the point of view of the field of learning and development, because I am an instructional design um, by training. And I had learned, you know, the power of storytelling and how important it is to include it in presentations. And so I was dissecting your presentation and I just want to tell you it is absolutely brilliant the way you use storytelling to convey your message. And I want to thank you for it. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa, I got a confession to make though. In my company, I have a learning uh, design uh, professional that I hire. <laughs> <laughs> and I call her my little police officer. She's there to actually help me. And she's, uh, you know, had to say to me a few times, no, 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 you're confusing people. No, no, no. Like fix this, fix that. And, and the cool thing about, you know, instructional design is she's really taught me about the importance of, you know, constructing things a certain way so people will understand. So great respect for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I love that you are consulting uh, people in our field. It, it gives me hope because I felt like we were so underutilized before the pandemic. And after the pandemic, they discovered that we bring value. And so I'm glad that you have that in your organization because it's working. Thank you. So, Mike, as we know, <clears throat> finding common ground, it's the key to doing this work, doing this work impactfully, doing this work well. Um, but sometimes it's that breaking the ice, um, almost like that first date. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> um, and so I'm curious um, as to some of the things you might do to break the ice. You know, I'm going to go back to it. And I'm, I, I mean this very sincerely, everyone. It starts with me. So oftentimes, you know, I had to get used to being sent to the South and again, I can tell you some stories about the places I've spoken to. No one's looking like me for miles, for miles. And I'm thinking, why the heck did they even pay me to come in? But, you know, they did. And even though they would hire me to come in, it was still kind of awkward. Like maybe they weren't used to talking to a person of color. So, you know, I had to remind myself that, number one, I had to check in with my emotions. Not go in there defensively, not go in looking for a fight or being prepared for whatever, but just going in as a human and checking in with my feelings. And, you know, sometimes the simple act of just looking into someone's eyes and just saying, hello, and how are you, connects you with them. That's all it really is. And, you know, I've ended up with so many great relationships in parts of the country where you think like, you know, black people and white people don't get along, you know, there. So that's that's what I have learned. It goes back to, it starts with you. It's about checking with yourself, the energy that you're bringing. Now, let's say you go into a situation, I, I'm, I'm a man and maybe you're a woman and you've had some issues with men. Well, you know, you might be hesitant to talk to me. So there might be some defenses coming up and that's okay. It's important just to be aware of that because when you're aware of that, it's gonna make the conversation go differently. You're gonna actually feel more empowered when you do and actually more in control of it. So that's why it's important to start with the emotions when you're having these sensitive conversations, you know? Also, someone might say something to you that makes you really uncomfortable, you know, that you've never heard before, that makes you feel like a bad person. There's nothing wrong with feeling that way. Again, check in with yourself about it and be curious. That's the other thing. When someone has a different point of view than me, um, you know, I, I try to go to curiosity. I have this friend that I, that I met in the South. Um, his, his name is Jeff and uh, he, uh, he wears a big old cowboy hat. And uh, Jeff and I went out for drinks in, in South Carolina a few months ago. And, and Jeff had to warn the waitress. He goes, he goes ma'am, I just wanna warn you, it's gonna sound like we're fighting at this table, but we're friends. We love each other. We just, we just very passionate and, and it's going to sound like we're fighting. She goes, okay, whatever. I'll get your beers or whatever. And, and then right as she leaves, she goes, all right, let's talk about the election. Totally different points of view. Totally got to laugh about it. Totally got to ask questions to each other and just had a wonderful day talking about it because we approach it with curiosity, not a fight. So the key for a lot of this stuff is how you're going into the situation that can really diffuse it. That can make it worse. Thank you for that question. So Mike and I are friends. I can ask him questions all day long. We can, you know, break for coffee, <laughs> keep on talking. Um, so my my other question is um, when when you think of sometimes the immensity of the work, um, you know, I I sometimes. Uh, equate climate change and DI work. It's like, how do you solve climate change, right? Um, how do you grapple with that? And how do you begin? Can you, can you be more specific? 
when you're faced with the immensity of work um, and the, the, the racial equality work that we still need to address and do, how do you make sense of that immensity and how do you take that first step? God, it can feel overwhelming like it's never even going to happen. Yeah, right. You know, it's, I'm actually going to reference a friend who is a climate change speaker. And we had this talk recently because she's one of those climate change warriors. And she actually taught me that, you know, the worst thing that she ever did was um, try to, you know, get negative about it, and think about what still isn't done, but just make small changes. And that's something I've learned. You know, my main work is in mental health. I don't want people to suffer. You know, I, I, I know that people have pain. I don't want them to suffer. I want there to be no more suicides. I want you to be able to deal with your depression and, and enjoy life and smile. But, you know, I know that, you know, I'm not going to be able to see that in my lifetime. However, it's important to remember that the small steps that you can take, you never know what the result's going to be. So let's just say you have an interaction with someone just on the street that's different than you. And you just say hello and how are you doing? How's your day going? you might change their whole view of you forever and they might go on to do some work you never know about. So part of the way of dealing with the immensity is realizing that a lot of the work we're going to do or doing now, we're not going to see the results for and that's okay. The key is to still just do that with the intention of knowing that things kind of work out themselves. And that's what really keeps me going is just looking for those small opportunities to connect with someone to make a difference. And I realize, you know, I just did, did what I could for that day. And you'd be surprised. It actually does start to have a domino effect in different ways. Thank you for asking that, Gloria. It's a good one. Anyone else? Feel free to unmute or put your question in the chat. The thank yous. So we have a, a probably safe to say 80 plus percentage of this Zoom room presence are behavioral health, mental health professions, professionals, um, or people passionate uh, because we're all part of William James College. Um, so which to me equals givers, folks who are always responders, uh, uh -oh. not first responders. I know and, where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say to the giver of someone who is constantly giving um, as we begin 2022? Okay, I got a room full of behavioral health professionals. Um, um, first of all, as someone who uh, goes to a therapist and a psychiatrist and a mental health support group each week, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work you all do. Like, thank you so much. Um, even when us patients are being difficult, thank you. Like, you're really helping us. Um, the other thing I want to remind you is that one of the best ways to help anyone is by being the role model for it. And oftentimes I know a lot of mental health and behavioral health professionals who um, I, I, I suggest therapy to them. And, you know, they kind of look at me and go, no, I, I know this stuff. You know, why do I need therapy? You know, I'm the last person that needs it. I help everyone else. Let me, let me just remind you something about going to therapy and counseling for yourself. Um, the analogy, I think I might've used this the last time I spoke, uh, there's a restaurant in the United States called the Outback Steakhouse. You all know about this place, the Outback Steakhouse. And, and they got this dish called the Bloomin' Onion. And if you've never seen this thing, you go look it up. It's, it's, it's trouble. And that's not self-care, by the way. That's an escape activity of the Bloomin' Onion. But regardless, what it is is they deep fry this giant onion and it comes out and everybody looks at it and it gets to your table and just disappears in like two minutes. And the thing is, when it comes out, you see the layers an onion has. Yet you and I both know an onion has layers. But let me say that again. When the Bloomin' Onion comes out, you get to see the layers. Yet you and I both know an onion has layers. You and I are no different. There's what you know about yourself and what you don't know about yourself, but there's also what you didn't know that you didn't even realize that you didn't know about yourself. And that's where therapy and counseling come in for you. So it's really important to use that as a tool for self-discovery. If you feel that, well, I've been to therapy and counseling before, and I don't want to have to share my whole story again. Honestly, that's usually a sign you need to be in counseling, sharing your story again. So it's important to keep doing that for yourself, no matter how busy you get, no matter how much you think you know, it's going to actually help connect you with the people that you serve on a deeper level. Also, this term of self-care, you know, <laughs> y'all are the ones talking 
decided to take care of themselves. It's really important that you're doing that too for yourself. And I know it's hard, especially in the world we're living in, but we're really busy. But just remember, self-care is basically anything that you do for your health when you're not in the presence of a professional. So when you brush your teeth, that's a form of self-care. But being intentional about doing small things for yourself Again, it's going to not only help you get through this unique world that we're in, but it's going to serve as a role model for clients. And honestly, I, I th I'm thinking of my psychiatrist and just her sometimes sharing about certain things in her personal life with me. That has been more beneficial than even her like talking about some of my own problems because I see her as a role model. It's like, oh, she, she deals with her emotions this way. Maybe I should try that too. So that's why I say you have a great opportunity when it comes to self-care so you don't burn out and also to help those that you serve. And again, just thank you so much for the work that you do. All right, got Brave Soul posted in the chat. Um, in your travels, do you feel more people are more open now to mental health counseling? Oh, that's a great question. Yes and no. Um, certain areas of the country I go to, I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to say the state I went to, but I get to this like state conference and the woman picks me up from the airport and she goes, Mike, I'm just going to straight up tell you in our state, we are just backwards. So we're like a hundred years behind the times. And I'm like, don't judge yourself. I'm trying to like calm her down, get her to think positive. But um, I do think we're talking about it and, and people are talking about it more. Um, obviously with the pandemic, it became a much more popular subject. But here's the thing. Sometimes we're talking about it, but we're not going deep. Meaning, you know, I hear things about mindfulness and, and deep breathing and, you know, dealing with a bad mood and, and stuff like that. That's great. You know, or the importance of just admitting that you have a bipolar diagnosis. Okay, that's, that's good. We can do that. But learning how to really sit with your feelings at a deep level when they are uncomfortable, when they're difficult, that's really important to do. So, yes, we were talking about mental health before more than ever, but we need to get deeper into the subject and really go there and get uncomfortable. And so that's why, again, serving as a role model for that. I mean, I remember I was in a situation with um, some mental health advocates um, and we were being paid to be like a focus group for something. And I was just, this was years ago. I had just come off of a really bad breakdown and I was hospitalized. And um, you know, they ask everybody to introduce themselves like they do as adults in a room. They say, okay, everyone introduce yourself. And everyone's going around introducing themselves and, you know, they're all talking about their work and stuff. And all I could say was like, you know, this hotel reminds me of the hotel that I had the breakdown in and I'm having a rough day and I might have to call my therapist. And by me actually just saying that in that situation, actually eased tension in the room and got people talking much more deeply. I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. So again, we're talking about it more, but we need to go deeper. And that's the opportunity that all of you have in your work. 